I love the sound of your vocals. You use the Sony C800. The mic? The mic, yeah. yeah it's either between the Sony or the Neumann. Or the like Neumann Sony, U87? Yeah, but the yeah, U87, but the, the Sony's... It, it, and the reason why I got those two mics is depending on the song and the mood. It's a different texture in both mics. Sony's real clean. Real clean, like real clean, crispy. Whereas the new one is a little rougher. So depending, like if I'm doing like hardcore hip hop tracks, I will use the new one. If I'm doing pop songs, I use this song. And this is specifically for your voice. Yeah, between the two, but I'm, I tend to use the Sony a lot more because the Sony brings out my tone a lot better. Okay. But if I'm doing like more sad, gutter, or just darker songs, then the new one will be the. Okay. If I'm doing a more happy, more club type record, song is the preference. And then from there, like, do you have a specific preference for preamp and? Nah, that's whatever. That's what exit exits signs. into. Yeah, that's that's really his choice and whatever he think will bring out a better, um, you know, quality. Right. Is with cover cut. You know, it's interesting that you know auto tune has been something that that has been used as an effect in hip hop quite a bit. Yeah. And some people use it to a real extreme. Um, I think you use it more in like the kind of subtle side. So what is, what is your sort of ethos about, you know, um, using autotune? I love it, personally. Yeah. I always thought that was the future. Um, I just, I probably put it like two notches on mine just for the texture. So if I'm a little bit, uh, tiny bit flat or whatever, and it keeps me in the same room to where my tone stays the same, but the key will be adjusted. I always try to use it that way to where it's not, you know, whereas, you know, T-Pain is different. That's his thing. He'll turn it all the way up to max. Yeah. To where you literally hear a robot voice. You know? Yeah. So I think depending on who's using it, it's their really their preference. For me, I like the sound exactly the way I sound on the record when you hear me live. So I try to just keep it just to where my, um, it's balanced to where the keys is adjusted and my voice stays the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's a real, it's a thin line between that though, really, so you gotta really think about it and adjust it to where it really makes sense. But now it's to a point now, I don't even, I, I go to, I use Melodyne before I use auto -tune because that, I can keep my same voice tone and still be able to adjust the keys and where I'm, I'm having trouble. Melodyne is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, it don't change your, vo your vocals, tone, or pitch at all. Right. It just adjusts whatever it, it does. trying to adjust. Yeah, it doesn't have that like shelf weird like ding, 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 yeah, you know, thing. Exactly. It just does like exactly. And you can see it so clearly. Exactly. With auto tune, it's like. Yeah. I, I never really figured out how to use it really. Like. <laughs> But, but Melodyne is so clear because you have the waveforms and... Exactly. And you know exactly what you're adjusting. You can see where you're, you're adjusting. Um, so, so live, how, I mean, you use that live too? No, live. I just use basic. I go live, raw. Right, okay. So it's more, that's more of like just a straight studio thing. Oh, yes, it's all, effect. for me it is. It's just straight studio. Yeah. That's it. And that's only because you got the effects in the studio. You might as well use them. Right. And we mix, and then... This is a master. This is what people are going to be listening to for the rest of their lives. So you want to make it sound as good as possible. Live, that's a one-time thing. You miss a key, so what? You get a chance to perform again tomorrow. <laughs> With a record, if that key is messed up, that's what you hear for the rest. Every time they play that song in a club, in a bar mitzvah, in a wedding, wherever they play that song, that key is going to just irk you. Yeah. So I like to fix everything. Yeah. You compress as you track? I was always told you have to be careful with how much you affect something because then you have to live with it. Then it's like locked to tape. Um, well, me, the only problem, the only reason why um, I affect as I track is that a lot of these plugins ain't going to be available six months from now. Only thing about digital is constantly upgrading. And you track it raw, then you mix it with all the effects that you love. And then you upgrade that software, and all those upgrades and all those effects that you had on there before no longer exist. And you can't find the old software because they discontinued it. So it kills the whole purpose. And I was like, yo, never again. I'm going to start. If I like it, I'm just going to track it like that. 
that way the, the effect stays with me forever. If they ever if they stop making that plug in or stop making that effect, at least I got that effect in my room on that particular instrument. So I always track, do whatever that like, whatever I like to hear it. I track it that way, so now it's easier for the um, engineer to mix. I don't have to worry about him finding it or messing up that plug-in. All you gotta do is level it out, make sure everything is good. His job is easier, my conscience is clear, and we go. Against the grain, interesting because there were synth sounds, a lot that was filling up the space. There's this massive sound, but nothing gets in the way. Yeah. You know, like there's a clarity. And how do you achieve that? How do you get that like clarity, but also this like full sound? That's the key. Like, really, the simpler the track, believe it or not, a lot of times the the fuller it can be if it's properly cued and you put the right 808, right bottom, right hi hat, right snare, whichever one you decide to use. That bass line and whatever that key instrument is going to be that drives it has to sound full. The key is to find a, a instrument that sounds full and then keep it simple. And then just add some strings maybe in the chorus, bass line maybe in the chorus. Other than that, sprinkles here and there, but that's it, don't overdo it. But that kind of record, the melody is what drives the song. And that fills up everywhere else, where there, wherever there's empty space, that melody will fill it up. Or do you find that sometimes even the, the smash tracks take some time to develop? Um, no, absolutely not, because I did What You Got for Kobe in 10 minutes. You did which one? What You Got. Oh, yeah? I said single, I did that in 10 minutes. Um, the Cardi record, Cardinal Official, the Dangerous record was done in 15 minutes. Like, Have you ever done, like, a hit record that, that took, took some time? Um, Mr. Lonely probably took the most time out of all my records. Probably took about an hour to do that. <laughs> but nothing ever... Nothing never exceeds an hour. Hmm. It's done just like that. The beat will be done 10, 15 minutes, and write the lyrics may take about two, three hours the most. Yeah. If I'm overthinking it. Yeah. But half the time, our concepts is in my head while I'm making the beat. You know? Yeah. And then from there, there's all the all the tweaking and whatnot that goes exactly. into That's it. That's what takes the time. The mastering, the mixing, the tweaking, the editing. That's what takes all the time. Bass and kick drum, that's something that we talk about all the time. You have two sounds that can easily get in the way of one another. Is there a priority, one or the other? With bass and 808, yes, yeah, definitely a priority with me. The kick comes first, you know, because the kick has to be the one, it has to be what drives the track itself, drives the rhythm, drives the tempo, and then the bass comes second as far as like the 808 or the bass bottom. You know, and that has to be adjusted to where it don't clash with the kick. It almost as if the, the bass has to support the kick rather than the kick support the bass. Okay, so you will actually EQ out some of the, the bass? Um, not necessarily EQ it out, but um, I keep the bass as full as it is. I don't take anything away from the bass. But it's a certain fre frequency that you have to be able to catch to where it works you know, side by side with the kick. And that's take time just to figure it out. A lot of times, like you would do it, like and that, that comes in the mixing process too. Because if you try to do it while you're in the tracking process, you're gonna be, you'll never finish the beat because it takes so much time. But once the song is complete with lyrics and everything, you know exactly how to adjust the bass to where you can hear it just enough to where you can vibe, you'll feel that buzz and that vibration in your chest, and yet it still don't clash to, with the kick or any other instrument. Is that more of a feeling or is that... It's definitely a feeling. Okay, so it's not it's like scientific... Feeling. Nah. M music has never been scientific. I don't care what it is. Like, I'll be doing something like, uh, you gotta turn it down to DB. It's in the red. I'll be like, well, do you hear the difference? No. All right, well then keep it where it's at. <laughs> That's me, period. All that? Nah. I like for it to beat and sound crispy clear rather than follow the rules and the volume is mad low, and you gotta boost it. I'd rather just go and hear it and feel it. If it feels right and hears right and that sounds right, rather, I go with it, regardless of what uh, engineering rules it is breaking. 